Uh, from Jigsaw Trading, it's uh, 2020 market vision, staying on the right side of the market. Uh, he has a presentation that he's going to give, and then we're going to, you can ask your questions, and then I will answer, or ask them to him at the end. We'll do all the question and Q&A at the end. Uh, obviously, there's risk with trading. Here's a, the standard risk disclosure. If you're watching this later on YouTube, please like and subscribe. So at this time, we'll hand it over to Dave. Uh, here. Okay, thank you, Terry. Let me uh, get to the right place on my slides. Okay, right. So in this webinar, we're going to take a look at staying on the right side of the market, both in terms of what sort of market activity to look for, and how the jigsaw tools can help, especially the new auction vista heat map. We're going to show you how historical order flow charting can be used to reveal areas where a market's likely to break down, and help you define stop locations and trade entry points that maybe wouldn't be obvious on a traditional price chart. We're going to look at how to identify spoofing and icebergs, both in real time and historically. And along the way, we're going to consider how this information differs on thinner markets like crude and DAX futures and thicker markets like the E-mini S&P 500 and US Treasuries. Now, in this chat, I'm going to primarily talk about long positions. Uh, just presume that the opposite applies for shorts, because then I won't say, you know, if you buy or sell, you know, and uh, probably be a bit easier to listen to. But first, let's spend some time having a chat about HFTs, algorithmic trading, and market making. Because after all, if you're going to stay on the right side of the market, then you have to stay off the wrong side. And of course, it helps to have some idea of who is on the other side of your trade. You know, when you place a trade, if you buy, somebody else sells, you know, why are they selling at that point? There's a lot of hype nowadays about HFTs. I we have vendors talking about tracking the algos or beating the algos, but there's very rarely an explanation of who you're beating or what it is they're doing. So you might hear someone say, oh, you see this white area on my screen? That's an algo. Okay, so, you know, which firm is it? You know, what's the strategy by it being employed by that algorithm? You know, what's their holding time? And there's even a few trade rooms where you know, we've got groups of retail traders coming together. They see a move initiate and they start calling out stuff like the algos are taking the market up to VWAP. Now, whilst the market may well go to VWAP, is there any evidence that it's specifically the work of a single algorithm that took it there? And there's often a presumption that if something happened, then an algorithm must have actually made it happen. And when traders get stopped out of trade, many and they're blaming it on predatory algorithms, saying, oh, the algos took me out. But how realistic is this viewpoint? Because if you're like me, you probably want to validate major assumptions about the market before you change the way you trade to accommodate. Now, according to this quote here from Wall Street Journal, they're just I'm presuming you can all see my cursor. So if you can't, please holler. Look at this quick quote from Wall Street Journal. The best days for HFT are when the markets are going up and down with high volume. In other words, they are beneficiaries of volatility. And that differs somewhat from the notion that HFTs are the cause of volatility by actively pushing the markets up and down. And backing this up, on the right, if you can read that, is an article um, that talks about HFT firms engaging in market making. And market making is a very different activity in terms of risk, time in trade, and market impact from those trades. So what we're going to do is wipe the slate clean in terms of what HFTs are rumored to be doing, and let's look at the things that we know they are doing and why they're doing it. Now, this information doesn't come from me. Okay, So this isn't a presentation of what I think goes on or what I guess goes on. This does come from people in the industry. They know who they are. I would like to thank them for it. Any errors in here are mine and not theirs. And the good news is that uh, there are a lot of online sources that back up this information, and you can go and research for yourself. So don't just take my word for it. Now, most people here are futures traders trading outright directional positions. So buy to sell higher, sell to buy lower. And this is where some of the misunderstandings about HFT come from. So people are trading a certain way. And they presume that HFT's algorithms must be trading the same way they trade. And most retail day traders 
are looking for usually 10 or more ticks in a trade. You know, trading a handful of contracts a few times a day, withholding times in minutes or hours. And of course, there will be some scalpers in here that trade more frequently, but for fewer ticks. So let's stick to the futures markets as it's what we know and consider the following strategy where your losing trades cost you 20 cents and your winners get you $12.30. You have a one tick target, but a break even stop loss. You trade five lots at a time and you do this 25,000 times a day. You've got little or no directional bias. All you care about is getting filled at the bid and then either scratching the trade at break even or getting filled with the offer for a one tick profit. Now, how many times if you did this would you need to be right to make good money? Well, if you are wrong 90% of the time, you would still make $130,000 a day. And this is typical of one type of strategy currently employed by HFTs. And like most of their strategies, their focus is on minimal to zero risk and a very, very favorable risk reward profile. Now, the top band of discount at the CME starts with an average daily volume of 135,000 contracts. Now, this is not for designated market makers. So designated market makers get this discounted rate at mere 50,000 contracts a day. But we're going to talk about those guys later. Now, at this level of volume, it's costing nine cents for clearing plus one cent to trade or 20 cents per round turn. Now, I've actually heard lower figures than this quoted, but I can't find them on the CME website, so let's just stick to what's on the CME site. And I think we can all agree that these discounts are there to encourage higher frequency traders. After all, if 135,000 contracts a day isn't frequent, then I, I, frankly, I don't know what is. Now, on the... 30-year treasury bond futures, a lower volume market, you can get as low as 18 cent risk with a massive 3125 tick size. And this style of trading is all about getting a good Q position, also known as getting to the top of the book. And that means being at the front of the limit order queue or close to it on the inside bid or offer and being the first to get a fill when market order comes in. And that means doing it on every bid, every level. Now, if you're first in line on the bid side and you have some liquidity behind you, then you're going to get the first fill when market orders come in. And you can take a one tick profit at the offer or you can scratch the trade. Now, with this style of trading, there is an exceptional risk reward ratio. You don't need a high win rate. You do not need to trade large just frequently. And you do not need to move the market around. And you don't need to risk a lot of money per trade. Now, of course, to make this work, you actually need to get filled on the bid and get out of the way before the bid breaks. And that's where a lot of the intelligence resides in this form of market making. They need to sit on a lot of bids. They need to decide when it is the best time to put their bid in. They need to cancel those bids before they get a fill if the trade looks to be risky. And they need to scratch the trade if they think the bid will break and the price will move against them. Now, getting to the top of the order book isn't easy. There's a lot of competition. So we see a lot of activity on the bids and offers as algorithms add orders, get to the front of the queue, front of the queue or close to it, and they'll pull orders if they think there's risk, um, and then add them back in if that risk is no longer present. So we see thousands and thousands of changes in the bids and offers that really have absolutely no impact on the average trader at all. And they also have virtually no impact on market direction overall. Now with this strategy, once in a trade, what they must guard themselves against is something called sweep risk. And that's the risk that the bid they entered on will be swept away by sell orders and the price will move one tick against them. In that case, leaving them unable to scratch a trade for that 18 to 20 cents loss. So if they think there might be a chance of a sweep, they will exit at the bid they got in on. So how would they predict a sweep? Well, first of all, in all the ways we'd expect, some of the things they use will be based on components we use ourselves. So, for instance, looking at the queue behind you to make sure there's plenty of liquidity there is fairly obvious. Now, if you're long on the bid and the bid shrink, then the sweep increase risk. Uh, the sweep risk increases. Now, using other market generated information such as activity in correlated markets or market internals makes sense. Although it has to be said, I've not seen the code of the HFT, so that is speculating. Now, I have spoken to industry insiders that said. Some of the lesser HFTs 
are using single market models, meaning they're only using data from the market they're trading, and they aren't actually doing very well at it. And what annoys many people is where these HFTs use an information advantage to guard against sweep risk, and HFTs paying for order flow seems to be the one that many people consider unfair. So this is actually a common practice with stocks on NASDAQ, which if you didn't know is, a, is actually a network of exchanges, not a single exchange. So whilst you can target a specific exchange when trading NASDAQ, most people will put in a market or limit order, which they presume will go to the best exchange at, this po at that point in time. And those are called non-directed orders. And those non-directed orders will often get sold to the highest bidder who then gets to route that order. And at the same time, they have an information advantage because they know about those orders before they hit in the exchange. And here we see a report from TD Ameritrade that shows Citadel and Knight as the number two and three buyers of TD Ameritrade order flow. And these are two of the largest players in the HFT space. So 48% of market orders placed on TD Ameritrade accounts get sold to those two players. Now we can also see not too bothered about buying limit orders. After all, with this strategy, they want to know about orders that will consume liquidity, move price, and not add to liquidity. Now the term toxic order flow is a term we've seen recently used in the retail trading education space. And no doubt that's going to be a buzzword that's going to get misused and overused over the next few years. And the definition of toxic order flow is simple. If you're filled at the bid and trying to exit at the offer, then any threat selling that threatens to sweep the bid you're filled at is toxic. It represents the risk of losing more than your trade fees. So put it simply, toxic order flow is not really much more than selling activity that threatens the current bid or buying that threatens the current offer. It means nothing more than the price is likely to move down one tick. It doesn't imply the market's going to follow through and move 10 points, it just represents a very small move. So that order flow is only toxic to the HFT that is concerned with scratching a trade or making a tick. It's a nonsensical term to us retail traders where most traders are looking to take many ticks on a trade. Anyway, the upshot is that order flow can be purchased, which means a firm like Citadel, Knight, Jump, Getco, Virtue, etc., may get orders from TD Ameritrade before anybody else and they can scratch their bids if they feel the order flow, or sorry, they can scratch their trade if they feel that that order flow represents sweet risk. Now it's not quite front running people's trades, but it's not a million miles away either, which is why it's quite unpopular. Now how big are the firms doing this? So if we get an understanding of how big the firms are, we get an understanding of you know their total share of the market. Well, most of the HFTs are private companies, so they don't have to publish their results, but we can get an idea of their scale from their operations and from their slip-ups. Now, in 2012, the model broke down at Knight Capital due to a what they called a software glitch. Now, I've heard rumors that it wasn't quite a software glitch, but that's another story. Now, this is a firm that in the first half of 2012 was responsible for 11% of all U.S. equity trading, and that is really, really big. And then one day, a glitch introduced risk. Now, Knight Capital lost $172,000 a second for 45 minutes. And in 2012, $172,000 a second was a lot of money. Now, if you look at the article, you can see that this was down to a bug in their market making software. Now, considering their overall transaction size per trade is actually relatively small, that is a massive number of trades being executed. Now, one of the impacts of HFT that is visible to the retail trader is the tendency for price to quickly collapse and then recover. Now, at any time, there can be multiple players trying to figure out if the bids behind them are still safe. And there's a finite number of ways to do that. So be assured that many are looking at the same data points. And that, in turn, means that it's possible for multiple HFTs to consider bids unsafe all at the same time and all attempt to unwind or pull their limit orders to avoid getting positioned in the first place. And this is one of the reasons we see mini flash crashes where prices collapse and then recover just as quickly. It's not a move that's necessarily created by orders coming into the market, 
but rather by orders being pulled from the market. So it's not a move created by the desire to profit, but the desire to avoid risk. So overall, there's little benefit in trading this sort of market making activity, um, even if you could uh, track it. These small trades are not moving the market. They're in and out over and over again all day, just chipping away at the market and taking small risk-free profits over and over again. And with these companies playing around the spread, we should actually all be able to agree that when an HFT is bidding the market, they're providing liquidity. Once they're filled at the bid, they're going to offer the market and they're going to provide liquidity there too. So we do benefit from narrower spreads. The thing is though, unlike designated market makers, these HFTs have no obligation to trade and so they tend to all disappear when conditions aren't optimal. Now we've mentioned market making a couple of times. So what exactly is that? Well, you can make a market without being a designated market maker or rather putting limit orders into a market is effectively making the market. Now HFTs are employing market making, making techniques yet they aren't necessarily designated market makers. So what's the difference between a HFT making a market and a designated market maker? Well, designated market makers take risk. They're obliged to sit on both the buy side and the sell side of the order book. And in turn, they get fee reductions and even fee credits for taking on this role. HFTs, on the other hand, have no such obligation. So they can just disappear when the going gets tough. Designated market makers have to trade in all conditions. The market makes of both types keep spreads narrow and they give us the other side to trade with when we want to get in and out of the market. So most market making, we have to say, is algorithmic and that's a good thing because it means there's generally little lag in the availability of liquidity as price moves around. Now to highlight the risk a designated market maker takes, in the crash of 87, many market makers were effectively bankrupt because they'd been obliged to trade both sides of the market through that crash. So nowadays we have two types of market maker, the designated market makers that have to be there through good times and bad, and the HFT fair weather market makers who've got less incentives from the exchange, but the ability to just jump out of the market isn't to their liking. And that's one of the reasons we see exaggerated swings in liquidity and volatility in today's markets. There's a lot of market making going on that just stops abruptly if market conditions don't look too good. And if you look at the ES, when you see the VIX climb up over 24, 25, we lose, in some cases, about 50% of the liquidity on the order book. And it does make you wonder exactly how long will the designated market maker be around. Now, other types of algorithmic trading, uh, amongst some arbitrage is probably the next biggest. Um, and that's also algorithmic and, and does present a very large proportion of all trading. And there are many different forms of arbitrage and the common characteristic again is a theoretical low risk compared to trading outright or naked unhedged positions and it's simply the process of trying to make money from some sort of a price discrepancy and this has been around for many years and traditionally has been the process of capitalizing on price differences between two or more markets so for instance index arbitrage is trading an index derivative such as the e-mini S&P 500 against a basket of stocks when the futures and the stocks diverge too much, so for example, futures go up and stocks go down, then an arbitrage opportunity occurs. So you sell the futures and buy the stocks. The risk to the trader is that the instruments continue to diverge and they have two losing positions. Although it has to be said that is actually quite unlikely. Pairs trading involves trading two or more stocks with some kind of relationship against each other. So for instance, it could be two stocks in the same sector. That generally move together and pairs trading is all known as also known as statistical arbitrage we have the crack spread where we trade oil against uh, oil based derivative products such as gasoline the knob spread which is notes over bonds and there's also arbitrage between currency futures and cash forex and we could go on but you get the idea that this this does represent a huge proportion of all trading and this is very much what most uh, futures prop trading is all about too now it's arbitrage that keeps the related markets in line. In fact, as competition increases for arbitrage opportunity, the potential reward for arbitrage trades gets smaller and smaller as people or algos are prepared to step in front of each other and trade a smaller price discrepancy. 
Then we have algorithmic rebate trading. Now, in 2010, trading in Citigroup, just that one stock, right, one stock Citigroup, represented almost 7% of all stock trading in the market. Now, Citigroup was trading under $5 a share with a range of about 5 or $0.06. Cents. And on a good day, 300 million shares would trade. So 300 million shares, 5 to $0.06 cent range. The traders were given, because it doesn't make a lot of sense to trade so many shares with such a small range, but basically, traders were given a small rebate for providing liquidity by the exchange. Because of the low price, $5, the low volatility, 5 to $0.06, cents, and the low margin, this attracted a bunch of HFTs. Now, the Citigroup management really weren't very happy about this because their, their share price effectively couldn't move because of all liquidity. And that HFT activity only stopped when Citigroup did a reverse stock split to increase their share price and in turn increase the margin requirements to trade that rebate. And when Citigroup stopped, I think they, they moved to Bank of America next. So don't presume for a second that algorithmic trading is evenly distribu distributed across all markets. This Just this one stock represented 7% of all trading. Now, the other one that gets people a little bit upset is latency arbitrage. And that's what the book Flash Boys is all about. And it involves quite large infrastructure investment to be the fastest point between two exchanges to make one cent in price discrepancy between the two. And this is another HFT activity that people generally aren't very comfortable with because they feel it is really, really close to front running. Now, of course, there's other kinds of algorithmic trading. We're not going to go all through, through all types of arbitrage or all types of algorithmic trading, but the information is online if you want to learn more. And many platforms give you the opportunity to place automatic exit orders once you've filled on the position, and that's an algorithm. Platforms and exchanges allow you to ice an iceberg an order, that's an algorithm. Platforms allow you to split up large orders and send them in random sized chunks. It's, once again, that's an algorithm. So in these cases, the algorithm is really just helping a discretionary trader work a position. So when we look at the huge percentage um, of algorithmic trading as a, you know, as a percentage of all trading, don't presume that this is all decision-making robots or market-predicting robots or market-moving robots. Now, if most algorithmic trading is a form of arbitrage or market making, then it's not particularly predatory. Okay, they're just in it for a cent in many of the cases. But that doesn't mean that predatory trading doesn't exist. Now, from a risk perspective, predatory trading is a massive step up from HFT. So HFT is trying to be low to zero risk. Predatory trading is going against other weaker traders and it is inherently risky. Now, predatory trading is also a step up in terms of time consumed per trade compared with HFT. And that, in turn, means fewer opportunities per day. So to be a predator, you're looking to catch people offside. And these plays are a little bit like bluffing in poker. In the example over here, we see some spoof or fake orders on the offer side. And we see, on the bid side, an iceberg order absorbing the resulting selling. So by definition, this type of play must be given time to work out. You need people to see the opportunity, fade the market, and get stuck. So if you only put your fake offers up for a microsecond, not many traders are actually going to see it. Now, any predatory move is inherently risky because you can't guarantee people will react how you want them to, or that some of the larger predator won't take you out. So you could sell in stops only to find the stops aren't where you thought they were. And there's also less opportunities per day to do it, partly because it takes longer and partly because you need to be in an area where you think people are going to play the market a certain way anyway. So you need market conditions to be right for this type of trading. You can't manipulate, for instance, a one-way high-volume market. Now, not only is there a risk of losses with the manipulation, there's also a risk of a fine or a ban. Now, in this case, Nitin Gupta was doing something called flipping, which is basically sitting with large offers out there to encourage people to sell, then having an iceberg on the bid, buying from those sellers. When he'd bought enough, he'd then pull his offers and start buying, but just to nudge prices up so that the sellers get stopped out and nudge the prices up even more. Now, it's a risky business for a couple of reasons. So first of all, he could get his bids filled and have the market pushed down against him by a bigger fish, or some news could come in that pushes the market down. 
he could get his spoof offers filled and have the market push against him that way. So how do you avoid being pushed around by a predatory tra trader? Well, these guys are opportunity, opportunists and not daredevil. So they can't stop a one-way move. So when a market is heavy, heavily directional, they're not in a position to step in front and move it around. So predatory traders are going to be thriving in range-bound conditions. So when a market comes quiet, is ranging, it's pretty easy to just nudge the market outside the range and then back in to stop out reversal and breakout traders. Now these guys can't necessarily see your stops. You know, there's no reason to think Nitin Gupta could see your stops because he didn't need to. He knows where they are anyway. The fact it appears you're being taken out by someone is probably more likely to be down to the way you trade and not some big bad predator. Now predatory traders aren't going to be able to push the market 10, 20 ticks to get to your one contract stop order. So the cost outweighs the potential for They're not really to go retail. So mostly it's common sense. Um, you know, if your market's putting in average volume, there's no news driving the action, there's no news imminent, we're coming back to the high of the day, there's a good chance there's going to be some games played there. And you have a choice to put in a wide enough stop and suffer the gameplay, or just let the area play out and then get on board to take advantage of any momentum that results. And now we know there's a lot of traders that are kind of permanently fading the market, always trying to buy the low of the day or sell the high of the day. Much of the time, they get stopped out, not because of predatory trading, but simply because overall momentum is against it. Now the predatory traders are bigger players than most retail traders, but many of these guys are individual traders. They are guys sitting at a screen doing this on their own account. So you've got to remember they have to be large because they have to have the account size to put in all those spoof orders. Okay, the market's not going to let you put in, you know, 3,000 lots of limit orders unless you've got the account size to support that. And the art of predatory trading is not so much to push the market around a huge amount, but rather to get other traders to do all the work. So if you, whether enticing you, it's whether it's enticing you to a bad trade or running your stops, they're looking to cause a reaction. They want you to react by getting stopped out, for instance. And they're going to be out of the trade when that reaction is complete. So once again, it's not moving the market tens or hundreds of ticks, but rather getting other traders offside. Those offside traders move the market five, six, seven ticks with their stops. So are you competing with the algorithms? Well, given the market neutral aspect of most HFT activity, it's actually hard to see how HFT is going to impact the average mouse trader whose reaction times are actually measured in seconds and holding times in minutes and hours. After all, we've always had traders with different holding times, and that's never really been an issue before. So we've always had long-term investors, swing traders, position day traders, scalpers, and now we've got HFTs. And we're all playing the same market, but at different time scales. And in a way, each providing liquidity to the people trading in the time scale above. So scalpers play the market a level down from position day traders, but they don't necessarily interfere with the position day traders' trades. So when was the last time you didn't get your 20 tick target on the trade and you said, damn, scalpers took me out? In fact, when a scalper is sitting on the bid and waiting for an exit, he may have just tightened the spread from position day trader wanting to get into the market. Now there's still, there's a lot of hype in the retail trading industry right now about the algos and the prevailing sales pitch seems to be that algorithms are responsible for large moves in the market. In other words, there are market moving algorithms that actually push the market around and have targets that are tens or hundreds of ticks away. And these algorithms are taking you out of your trades and that you need some special software or some special training to beat those algorithms because after all, they are the new enemy. But taking into account what we know about HFT, these market moving algos would absolutely also be the enemy of HFT because their order flow wouldn't just wipe out retail traders, but they'd run over HFT positions too. In addition to that, moving a market takes much more than just moving that individual market. So let's say you wanted to push up the e mini S&P 500 and you got long 20,000 contracts in the process of pushing up 10 ticks. That would not in itself move the stock market, the underlying market that the futures represent. So 
So by moving the futures and not the stocks, you'd actually create a price disparity, which in turn creates an arbitrage opportunity. And the arbitrage trade would be to sell the futures and buy the stocks or the ETF. And the moves up effectively that you generate with your buying would absolutely bring in more sellers. So in effect, you wouldn't have to overcome just the liquidity in the futures order book. You would have to drag up the 500 stocks in the index or the, and the, as well as the ETF. So why is this important? Well, we have to trade reality and not virtual reality. So retail traders are now being sold a vision of the market that tells them they are competing with algorithms and that these algorithms are moving the market. Now the quote here is from a professional trader that has told me I could use the quote that came through an email but would, has decided to remain nameless. Uh, but it puts it better than I ever could. So we've got a lot of traders that have become fearful of these market moving algos. And they get so wrapped up in looking for ways to beat them that they don't actually stop to think about whether this vision of the markets is true in the first place. So if you consider the HFT strategy we've discussed, there's obviously going to be a lot more activity now on the order book. There's a lot more adding and cancelling of orders. But it stretches credibility when people say things like, an algorithm spoofed the market down. Because the implication there is that it's possible to move a market with just with spoof orders without trading a single contract that spoofing is enough and it implies that professional traders will step in front of size on the order book consistently get taken out doing it and keep repeating that behavior what is much more likely is that HFTs are simply getting out of the way and this in itself is creating extremes of volatility so just like Black Monday a day where lots of funds employing similar risk management techniques all unwound at the same time and that snowballed and created a huge market crash Similarly, HFTs can simultaneously decide the markets are too risky and pull liquidity and create the conditions for a mini flash crash. That is not the same as manipulating the market. Now, most HFTs have very, very small targets. In many cases, just one tick. So even if you could trade against them and somehow take the tick from them, it's going to be very difficult to beat them long term when you pay 350 a round turn and they're paying 20 cents. Now, one article I read claimed that just before the S&P 500 reversed, a series of 50 one-lot orders would print on time and sales. And the author's theory was that these 50 orders were a signal to other algorithms to start trading in the opposite direction. So a kind of a, an algorithm Morse code, I guess. And the author, he actually seemed like a decent guy, but it does highlight the tendency to see a pattern and jump to a conclusion that the algos are not only working against us, but in this case, conspiring to work against it, to working together against us. And this type of thinking, seeing something occur and then making presumptions and come to a, a misplaced conclusion is typical of what we're seeing in the industry today. It's cause and effect backwards. People are seeing something occur, seeing the effect, and then convincing themselves that market moving algorithms are the cause. So we have a lot of presumption, supposition, and a fair amount of fear mongering. Unfortunately, in many cases, the goal is to part you with your money to pay for a solution to a problem that you probably don't even have in the first place. Now, make no mistake, predatory traders do exist. They always have done. Stops are going to be run. They always have done. But the main goal of HFTs is to make relatively risk-free money frequently and not to move the markets. Now, with predatory trading, it's, it's good to know they're there. But trading against them is folly if you don't have the size. But also, trading with a predatory trader is also risky. Because just because someone's trying to spoof the market, it doesn't mean they're going to be successful. So you can end up trading with somebody who's in a losing trade because that particular attempt isn't successful. And again, they can afford those losses because they don't have the kind of costs that we have. So the bottom line is that markets have always moved around. They did before algorithmic trading ever existed. And the existence of volatility is not proof of algorithms moving the market. In fact, volatility increases and mini flash crashing crashes are as likely to be caused by HFTs getting out of the way by pulling their orders than them actively pushing the market. And the reason this is so important, and the reason I've talked so long about this, is we need to avoid falling into the trap of trying to solve a problem we don't actually have because staying on the right side of the market does not require you to trade against robots or make decisions in nanoseconds. Day traders are trading a level above HFTs and a level below swing traders and most institutions. And you can certainly ride on 
the momentum generated by longer term traders, but there's no upside in trying to beat an beat HFT. Because with HFTs, by the time the mouse trader knows they're there, they're already gone. So what does it mean to stay on the right side of the market? Well, in my opinion, it's part judgment and part luck. In the short term, it's judgment that gets you into a trade when conditions are good. When your overall analysis has told you where an entry may be appropriate. And when, just like an HFT, the market isn't going to run right past you after you enter. In other words, not entering against momentum. So it's a mixture of good price contextual analysis and trade entry refinement. And then there's luck, because once you get into the market, any number of things can happen that prevent you from getting to your target. And the longer your trades last, the more likely something unexpected will occur that turns the market against you. And that is absolutely fine. It's always been that way. Now, my personal focus for getting an entry and staying with a trade is on understanding short-term speculation, where the pain points are, and where short-term speculators might come into the market. Most of the time, the short-term moves in the market, <coughs> excuse me, are driven by short-term speculation. In other words, there's often not a lot of long-term institutional trading moving the markets. Then there are times where volume spikes, often after news, where we can say, this is exceptional volume, that's driving the market, and it is most likely institutional volume. Some days the picture is clear for speculation, and other days, especially when we see two or three days in a range, the volume will drop because the picture is not clear to other speculators regardless of how you look at the market. So the higher volume, heavily directional periods are theoretically easy to trade, although you sometimes have, have to sacrifice getting a good entry price by just jumping on board or the move passes you by. The average volume, speculation-driven days, often have three, four or more major intraday swings or short-term trends, and on these days, the right side of the market changes many times as speculators take profit, get stuck, or see profit more likely in a different direction. And on those days, Getting a handle of the order flow helps us to understand where speculators are trading right now and where they're getting stuck. And that brings us to the tools. But a word of caution, you know, with the advent of attractive looking order book heat map tools, there is going to be a natural tendency to focus on what's most visually stimulating. It's that kind of ooh, shiny effect. So we shouldn't lose sight of what is important or what activity these charts actually represent. So for a start, we need to carefully consider how much weight we give to market debt information because that is the prettier, shinier stuff. And compare that to the importance we give to the actual order execution and what that might say about other traders' positions. After all, the depth is intent or at best what they might do. And the order executions tell us where people actually traded and what the impact was. And we should also think about this in another way too historical versus current information. Because this isn't just about which view is best for reading order flow, it's also about which view is best at which time. Now, I know this is probably a bit blurry on there, but uh, we'll stick with it because um, this is kind of the lower bandwidth option for the webinar. Now, we can see market depth in two places here. First, we've got the depth and sales over here. Uh, we can see these inner blue and red background columns. That shows the bids and offers, just like any other dough. And outside of that, we can actually see changes to those bids and offers. Can't read that, uh, or assume you can't read that right now because the image is compressed. And then we can see the auction vista chart. So we've got offers above us in red, and we've got the bids below. And the lighter colors indicate more depth in that area. So everything to the left here of the vertical line is history, and this is the, the current state. Now we can also see order executions on the depth and sales here with. The current trade columns showing sells, the sold to bidders in red, and buyers in blue that bought from the offers, these blue numbers here. And that just shows us activity this time round. It's not cumulative. It'll be reset when we come back to a price. Over here on the auction vista, we can see execution in two ways. Between the yellow lines here, you might not be able to see that very well because it's OK. We, it's not the most important information. We've got something called the trade thermometer. And you can see over here um, on the left hand side, okay, we've got, um, sorry, over here, we have a long run of mostly left, uh, mostly red, sorry. Let me just go back a slide. Okay, I've actually, uh, I've actually missed a slide here. Okay, 
Now the large trade circles here represent areas where exceptional trade, uh, exceptional size traded. Okay, so we see areas where exceptional volume traded, but it's not at any specific interval, but it's over time at a price. Okay, let me just uh, click back. Okay, over time at a price. Okay, so we're going to look at this. I'm sorry about the uh, the text on here. Okay, so in these circles here, more blue represents more buy market orders and more red represents more sell market orders and we see those circles develop in real time as we trade at a price over time and it detects exceptional size okay now many trades are going to be attracted to these charts I feel put off a little bit by the numbers on depth and sales but over on the depth and sales it's not really about the numbers but it's really about the pace of the market the way it speeds up and down prices that are sticky and prices that we can't hold even for a second and of course it's also about how much volume it takes to get through prices but mostly it's about movement and we still recommend that people that are new to order flow start off with the depth and sales so they can get a, a raw unfiltered feel for the order flow now people benefit from seeing those order flow events playing out here first so they've got a good understanding of what the visual representation shows over here now, we all know that some market depth is real and some is fake, and sometimes the market depth reacts to price approaching it, and sometimes price reacts to the market depth. And in this case, we have exceptional market depth here, and we can see it was real. So on this day, we'd been as high as 30.61 on the day. We'd moved down to 30.46, and now this is a retracement back up to 30.55. So at this point, you might have been looking to see if the market was going to put in a double top, or to get short on a failed retracement. Now, on the way up to 3056, we can see exceptional depth here above us. At each price, we traded into that depth and off the state firm as we traded through them. And we can see that because it took exceptional volume to trade through exceptional depth. We've got the blue circle. The trading wasn't balanced on the way up. The aggressor side, the market orders, were predominantly buyers. And that's normal on the way up. In any move up, we'd expect an imbalance of around one and a half to two times buyers to sellers with price progression. So buyers were in a majority on the market order side, and sellers were quite happy to progressively absorb more and more of that buying as we moved up. And the imbalance actually ends up as being much more than two to one as we reach the turning point. So there's a noted lack of aggressive sellers here. And the reason is there's no need for smart sellers to be putting in market orders because they're sitting on the offer side absorbing the buying. Now, as the market rolled over, we can see that moderately high offers followed the market down. And this is just typical market make activity. And all they're doing there is they're looking to pick off traders that take trades against the trend. They are not holding the market down, they just think the market's going down, so they're heavier on the offer side. Well, so where do you enter here? Well, Let's remember the context. So we're in a pullback here in a move down, which is good context. But without that context, we should be sitting on our hands. So you could, for instance, enter when you see these high offers. But in my experience, that's a little hit and miss. So even if you're in a potentially new downtrend, you can't just sell in front of large offers or buy in front of large bids. And some people are telling traders to do just that, which, to be honest, is beyond belief because it simply won't work. Okay, if you want to follow that advice, that's fine. Just try it on SIM first. So it's extremely rare for me to make a decision to enter a trade because of high bids or offers. Because it's useful information, but it's not enough on its own. Where I'm more likely to enter is where the stuck buyers look to be getting stopped out. So we can see that this buyer absorption, where these blue circles are, appeared, uh, occurred from 3053 to 3057. And that means we have a cluster of short-term long positions in this area. And when we break that to the downside, these trades will unwind and help them move down. And that is the point at which I'd personally be looking for refinement over on the depth and sales. I'm watching the market tick up and down, looking for the ticks up to be weak and short-lived, watching for signs of downside momentum to build. And we can see to an extent uh, that on the trade thermometer over here, we've got weakness to the downside. Now, a lot of people are asking, okay, what is a signal to sell on this screen? Well, it's a fair question, but it's a bit more nuanced than this is a sell signal because we've got four distinct phases in this turn. So phase one 
we see the depth above us. It could be resistance or it could be fake. What it does absolutely mean is it's an area of interest. Two, we first start trading into that depth and it remains, it doesn't pull out of the way, the depth is real. We do trade through it, but basically they're not, they're letting us trade through it, they're not just pulling it out of the way. So we trade exceptional size into that depth, phase three. It means in this case that buyers are getting stuck a little bit. Now they don't all have to be buyers initiating new trades. Some could be exit orders, but on balance, there will be a good enough proportion of new positions here to help us when they stop out. And then number four, the market starts pushing down. And that's when we start to push these speculative, the new speculative buyers in this area out. Okay, it's not going to push every buyer in that area out. It's going to push enough of them out to help us to the downside. And at this point, the probability of a profitable short increases, but we do lose a few ticks on the entry price in getting that confirmation. So at any point from seeing the large offers above to the buyers being stopped out, we could have gone short. Where you go short yourself, depends totally on your own tolerance to risk. Now, of course, not every trade will follow through. So let's just look at how we can handle scenarios where we might have gotten into a trade and that then moves against us. So that's a good exercise in reading the market. This is later in the same day, still on crude. And we can see the market is coming down to an area of high buy side liquidity. Now, this price here is 30.35. It's also the point of control. And we can see large bids below the point of control. Market is in an overall down move, so any long trade is absolutely going to be against the overall trend of momentum. Now, personally, I'm no fan of trading the point of control. It's the area with the highest volume, and the market does tend to rotate around there. Now, as price drops down, it says price is coming down, we can see the depth is added to the bids. And we get to 30.35, and we see the first sign of exceptional selling selling there. We do see some of the bidders here pulling their orders but bear in mind that there's a lot of participants and there's always going to be a mix of spoof and real orders at any level so don't think of these high bids as all belonging to a single person now the first large red circle here eats most of the buy side liquidity at 3035 and each time we come back to 3035 we see exceptional size trade there and there's obviously an iceberg order there as we see, the aggressors mostly selling, but price isn't moving down. So the sellers are getting stuck. After six attempts at selling through 3035, we move up, but just five or six ticks. So the buy side liquidity does follow that move up. Okay. Now, as we move back down, we see large bids at 3036. Okay, as we come into it here. And we eat through those bids at 3036. We've got this big red circle here, and then the market collapses. Now, as an order flow trader, you know that buyers absorbed this selling over here, and that those buyers are going to be in peril if we move through that area. So, if you'd played the reversal here and taken the long, which is absolutely fair trade, there's nothing wrong with that, then seeing the momentum trade back down to your entry price would have been your cue to get out. Okay? If we can see over here, you might be able to just read the numbers on there, the size of the trades on the reconstructed tape, especially as we're at 36 and 37, we have some really big size selling in that area as we move down here. And this selling here is another potential entry point because there are plenty of short-term traders that trade momentum into stopper areas. And those are very, very fast trades where you're right or wrong very quickly. And the trade that most traders aren't looking for is the weak pullback back into this high volume area. And we can see that on the way up here, we've just moved up this back up here, this little pullback. We've just got one large trade at 3027 on the way back, back up. So we've got buyers holding off as we move up here. And we're approaching an area where sellers got the upper hand. So once again, you do have a potential entry point here. But this time, it's more because of a lack of activity than large size trading. In fact, my experience is that the easiest trades to manage are those where you pull back to an area of higher volume and at the same time you're seeing extremely weak counter trend momentum because there aren't a lot of traders engaging in these trades. The action is slower and there's less volatility there. Now, don't worry about learning all of these things at once because as you get more experience, these things will come to you. Just keep in mind that a lack of activity can have as much meaning as 
no activity, or there's a lot of activity. Now in this image, again, sorry for the quality, um, this is typical of the cases where a turn in the market is defined purely by order execution and the market depth isn't adding any significant information. So we've got iceberg orders being executed, we have hidden backstops being created, and we have exposed, opposing imbalances in a, at an extreme. So what we're seeing here, this is the ES, market moves up to 1912, but can't push through it. Yet the depth as we go up there is quite normal, there's no exceptional depth. The volume we trade at 1912 is exceptionally high, and the aggressors are mostly buying. The price can't move through 1912, but we see no sign of large size on the offer side. And that's only possible if there's one or more iceberg orders on the offer side. So as buyers buy, more contracts are added to the offers and the buyers get tra trapped. So simply, simple rule is if there's no debt, but you get a large trade circle, you are looking at an iceberg. Now this sort of activity, stopping at a single price with large tra size trading at a single price, is typical of thicker markets like the E-mini S&P 500. So it's quite rare to see this sort of thing on thinner markets like crude or DAX, where the market tends to trade high volume over a series of prices. Now the volume profile shows that at 12.75 up here, we have the bottom of an old range. So in terms of trade location, this is already an interesting area to go short. We've got 3,870 contracts traded over here, and that's what trades into 1912 over the series of circles. So what is the opposing imbalance? Well, we're imbalanced to the buy side at the high. The buyers are active in terms of market orders, but sellers aren't. There's no sell market orders here. The smart sellers are adding to the offers. So there's no reason for the bid to be putting in sell market orders at this point. So at reversal areas, you absolutely want to see the market imbalance to the buy side at a high or the sell side at a low. So hence the term opposing imbalance. So it's not just the size of these circles, the fact these circles are there, the imbalance gives you extra weight. And areas like this become what I call hidden backstop, because areas that, that might look irrelevant from a charting perspective, but they have order flow supporting the level of holding. In other words, the order flow is giving us trade entry points that might not be visible to a chart trader. And this is one of the most powerful aspects of order flow history, lines in the sand it can be both entry points and signals to exit if price crosses that line. So for instance, if you got short here or based on these circles and the price got above the circles, above maybe 1912, your trade is absolutely impaired. Now of course, you don't have to enter when you see the circle. In fact, it's often better to get in when you start to see the market break down. So don't think of this as a chart that's got a single entry point. You can get in when you see the first circle, the second circle, the third circle, you see those traders are getting trapped. Or you can get in when the market starts to move against them. And once again, sometimes there's as much information in what you can see as what you cannot. So for example, the fact we didn't see excessive offers at the high, but we knew they were there anyway because of the size trade, it tells us people are trying to hide their selling. So once again, always think about what you can't see as well as what you can. Now, I like to separate turns in the market into major and minor reversals. So a major reversal would be one that initiates a new intraday trend, and a minor reversal would be a simple pullback. So the end of trend moves are generally much busier. There's more trading involved in reversing an intraday trend than a pullback. There's more people engaged there, and it also means it's a spot where you're going to find more predatory traders. So in this image, I've actually set something we call the depth tuner. Uh, so that we're only actually seeing the significant depth, and that's why some of the depth appears to be missing. We start this image with some consolidation here after a move up, and then we move up from that consolidation area and back down into it. So this is your pullback, and this is a very typical pullback. And we can say a few things about the end of a pullback. So one, it often tests the high of a prior consolidation area or high volume area. Sometimes an iceberg will stop the pullback as bidders step in and absorb the selling. But a lot of the time, we simply run out of momentum. Sellers stop engaging. And this sort of turn is defined mostly by a lack of activity. So we don't see much. And this activity, lack of activity is as easy to read on the chart as the depth and sales over here. Now, as we get to the top, 
this is where we put in our full reversal. This is actually, I believe, the high of the day here on crude. We see an area of high liquidity above us as prices moved up. And we can see as we moved up, it's taking progressively more and more contracts to move through the offers. That's what, what the blue circles are telling us. And this is typical of a thinner market like crude, to see the market thicken up over a series of prices prior to a reversal. And once again, we end up with a very large circle where aggressors are mostly buying. And after another tick up, the market falls away. And once again, in terms of your entry, um, entering on this uh, high volume circle with the backup of the depth above is a place you could enter the market. But in my opinion, again, it's, it's a bit too risky. My own preference is to let the market break down a little bit. Okay, so you see some downside momentum or even wait for you know a little weak pullback such as here. So as usual, the cost of confirmation is you give up a few ticks. And once again, it all comes down purely to your own risk profile. Now, in many cases, the market depth is almost irrelevant. It's not a big part of the story. Now, in this image, we see just one price here with significant depth. And we actually trade it through it before an iceberg order help a market a few ticks down. So once again, we have an opposing imbalance, aggressive sellers of love. We know this is an iceberg order because depth there was insignificant, yet a large amount of size traded. And for that to happen, the bidders must have had in contracts there as we traded. The rest of the time on this chart, depth is absolutely insignificant. Now we can see the hidden backstop created by these trap sellers over here, or rather the buyers that engaged. And we come down and we see a lack of selling interest when we come back to that price. After all, sellers just got stopped out there. They're probably not that interested in trading there again. And many times you're going to see the market eat through areas of high liquidity. And sometimes that liquidity might be just one half of a, an arbitrage strategy. It really has no bearing on direction. Over time, you're going to learn that liquidity alone will not stop the market, not reliably enough for a full reversal. So seeing the liquidity gives you a heads up that something might occur, but that's all it is. How the market reacts to that, where the size trades is more important. Now we'll just go through um, one last slide, another blurred slide. I do apologize for this. Um, we mentioned earlier that context matters. So just take a, a step back and look how it fits into the big picture, how we could use this information alongside other actionable market information, uh, how we can use confirmed trades give us additional entry points that might not be on the chart. So here we have a full reversal on the S&P 500. The market is basically put in a 15 point move up from the open. We've actually got decent volume. We can see over here that volume has actually recovered here. And uh, it's, you know, we can see uh, down here, just before we, we, we peaked, we see a pause. And you know, you'll watch this. It's normal to see pauses in trends like this. And you know, we'll move up, build some volume in an area, and um, that's what we've done here effectively. So we've got this volume area. We've got some large uh, size traded here. But the important thing is we never moved through that large size. We just basically milled around in that area. So in effect, we traded around the volume, not through it. And from a tra value trader's perspective, we basically found value here temporarily. On the next push up, we see absorption at the highs and, in and opposing imbalance. And that area is quickly broken to the downside. And this is your highest risk, earliest entry opportunity. Now, contextually, that absorption is actually occurring at the day session weekly high. It's also just below the X's here, which mark out an area of high volume from overnight. So contextually, we do actually have a good area to short, um, either on the circle itself, which to me is just too risky, or when we start to break down, uh, which is much lower risk and poorer price. Now, as we got back to this area uh, where we put in our range, we can see large size imbalance on the sell side, which means the bidders are absorbing contracts. And you should expect additional volume to trade as you get back to that area where we traded the volume before. Now, looking for a break of that area, a break of this area, is your next opportunity to enter. Now, we break down through that area of high volume, and we can see the Dow and the NASDAQ here moving off their highs. And also, we've got the nice uh, starting to show signs of a sell-off as well. And then finally, we have a weak pullback back to this area where we traded the, the most recent high volume. And that's giving you the last selling opportunity on the chart. And that's your weak pullback 
actually, in my opinion, you're easier to trade. You're easier to trade, and obviously, there will be more pullbacks as we go uh, as the market marches down later. Now we can see that pull that weakness in the pullback, both in the order flow and in the lack of upside participation, in and also on the nicey tick on the Dow, the Nasdaq. There's just no upside. So you have context, you have other markets confirming, and you have order flow all coming together to help us gauge pressure to the downside. Now I won't spend much time. Oh, sorry. Uh, right now I'm going to skip a slide actually because we're running over. So right now would be a good time to key in questions. Uh, the Auction Vista historical order flow view is more than just a pretty user interface. It does give us actionable, ad additional actionable information that we can use to trade off. So it helps us to understand when traders are getting caught offside. It does give us additional prices that become potential entry and stop out points based on areas with concentrations of positions. Now, when using the tool, you have to think in terms of how the market is playing out over time and not just look for buy seg sell signals that occur just in one splice of time. Okay, The context is really important, um, as is the type of move you're trying to capitalize on. Because the end of a pullback, as I say, is often characterized by a lack of activity, where the end of a trend is usually characterized by a sequence of events, any of which can be your cue to enter the market, depending on your risk tolerance. Now, the market depth information can help as a heads up but trading against large depth on its own is absolutely a net losing strategy. And I know people are saying to do that, but just try it on Sim if you don't believe me. So the order book gives us a good heads up, but it shouldn't be taken too seriously in terms of giving specific signals on its own. Now, order flow doesn't replace good context because good context is what gives other traders, other speculators, a reason to trade too. And you're not going to get very far trading if you're the only person trading in a specific direction. Now, Auction Vista does provide additional context. Hidden backstops created end up that get created, and they end up being both your entry points and your exit points because those trades should those areas should hold on the test. Now, these events with order flow they're going to be playing out over time, so it's not in time slices of milliseconds, nanoseconds, picoseconds. The more obvious order flow events, so those iceberg orders uh, or large bids and offers, which generate areas of interest, high volume, and stuck traders. The less obvious ones are lack of participation. As for the algos, well, other than being behind a lot of fear mongering and sales pitches, I don't think you need to be overly concerned about tracking them specifically. You're tracking overall trade action. So if we get to the point where a discretionary trader needs to react in milliseconds, we're pretty much beyond what is humanly possible anyway. Uh, as for trading against spreaders or zero risk top of the book strategies for a tick, well, even if you could react fast enough, you don't have the commission structure to make it profitable anyway. As it is, any algorithmic trade will be amongst all the other trades reported, and ultimately, it's a sum of all trading that sets market direction. So if buyers overwhelm sellers, the market's going to go up. And when it no longer does, the sellers get trapped and the market reverses. And that's a cycle that repeats itself over and over. So I'd like to thank you for listening. I do apologize for the image quality. This is the first time uh, I've used this webinar software. Um, now we can go over any, over any questions you might have. Hi, guys. Feel free to uh, post your questions in the chat, and I'll ask them to Peter. I uh, remember there was a question, uh, is there a an API for Tixaw? There is no API right now. Um, that will be developed later on, but right now, no. Okay. Can you uh, briefly explain what flash spoofing is? Yeah, basically, flash orders are effectively when people put spoof orders for a very short amount of time. And there's a few theories be behind that. Um, one of them is that they're kind of fishing, um, you know, fishing for, for other algorithms. But yeah, a flash, a flash spoofing is generally, boom, they're putting an order. You see a thousand and dump, then it's gone. And uh, again, with that sort of activity, I've, I've not seen, I mean, you don't see that much of it nowadays. I've really not seen that much of a um, market reaction based on that. Okay. 
Uh, will Auction Vista have the ability to scroll back and see historical debt? Yes, you can scroll back right now, but we're going to release a version either Friday or over the weekend that has much better scrolling, scaling capabilities. So you yeah, have over the weekend. Okay. Um, can you explain the variables on the Auction Vista chart? Basically, we, there are very few settings because the software is intelligent enough to know what the large size is. But basically, you've got like a, you've got a time scale that you can show. Default time scale is one second. Um, then you've got a an interval width which you can say how much space do you want one second interval to take up. Then you've got a circle tuner, which on markets like crude, um, it is an intelligent piece of software. But there is there are some markets where there's a big disparity between average size traded and exceptional size traded. So on crude, for instance, you might have an average size per level of 10. But then when we start to get exceptional size, it skips up to 100. You don't have that kind of disparity on the ES. So you're able to tune out some of the circles on markets with those disparities. And then the last one is the market depth, um, where you can actually tune out some of the, the least significant depth. Uh, what is your thoughts on price moving to large market orders? Is there a difference between liquid and illiquid markets? Well, I, I believe you mean price moving toward uh, large limit orders. Yeah. On thin markets, yeah. price does tend to move towards large sites. Absolutely. Um, and you'll see a lot on crude, especially in the Asian session, you'll see a lot on crude. You know, you'll see three or four large limit order levels that go through it, tag the other side, and then move back. So absolutely, but on the ES on thicker markets, it's not so it's not so reliable. Okay. Uh, there was another question. Is the uh, what is the chart set to? Is it a minute range or is it its own? No, like I say, you can set the time frame. The default is a second. It is a one second. So you have to remember this is kind of a a very short term zoom in tool because um, you want to look at the order flow. So you're looking back, you know, if you're looking at the order flow, there's not really that much benefit in looking at the order flow from like six hours ago. Um, you know, you're looking back 30 minutes an hour. You can set it to like a 60 second time frame and see the whole day if you like. But um, generally, it, you know, you're setting time frames in seconds, not, not hours and minutes. Okay. Is it only time based or can you do ticks and range? It's all time based, all time based. Is this available for MC.net? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Do you need any special data feeds for this to work well? Well, with flow, um, the quality of the feed does matter. I mean, there's, there's some debate over it, but um, CQG is a fantastic feed. IQ feed, Kinetic are fantastic feeds. They're completely unfiltered. You get every piece of order flow information. Um, other feeds, I mean, Rhythmic is slightly filtered, but it's still a fantastic feed. Um, you go into feeds like TT, um, you're going to see prints on the wrong side with, with like the TT feed. Um, but then again, TT is the most popular, you know, TT's X Trader uses TT data, and that's the most popular trading tool. Um, you get to, to, uh, to fees like interactive brokers, then you're really going to struggle because they don't have a proper time and sale. So, but, you know, a, a lot of people are still buying, uh, you know, brokerage accounts with CQG feed. It's fantastic. So, um, you know, no, no real special feed. Okay. Uh, let's see. If you enter the market based on the high volume activity, the circles, do you know traders that then use that circle as their exit point stop? Yeah, well, that's me. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because I mean, basically, if you see um, absorption, where you know the the offers have stepped up, and people have traded into it, and time and time again, the offers have stepped up. You know, if you go short there, you're going short based on the offer stepping up. If you then go the other side of that um, that area and you stay in the trade, you're in a completely different trade. I don't know what you're doing, but you're not in that same trade anymore, which is leaning on that area. So absolutely, that is your stop out point. Mm -hmm. 
Is there a ten percent off discount for FIO Elite members? Absolutely. Yes. Yes. And, uh, and obviously, well, people are asking about level two. You would need level two data, correct? Yes, you need level two data. Yes, absolutely. Uh, how well does this perform with replay data? Um, it's okay. Replay data itself, I'm not a big fan of, basically. So um, yeah, it'll work with replay data, but you know, the data itself tends to be a bit chunky. Um, you know what we're we're really not you know we're not going to put a replay set functionality in into this product because you know, we're really all about you know real time execution more than anything else. Um, I found that a lot of um, okay. you know traders that want to review days do much better off videos uh, where you can go backwards forwards um, than a than a kind of chunky replay. Okay. Uh, on the reconstructed tape settings in the future, can you make it to where the block trade alert markers stay on the chart when Ninja Trader if we started? Uh, absolutely, we'll do that, and we'll also put those markers onto the auction vista chart as well. Okay. Large liquidity levels can they attract the price of the magnet to test it? Absolutely, as I said on, on crude or DAX, that's exactly what you see. Um, not so much. Not so much on the, the thicker markets. Okay. And is this a standalone uh, plugin or does it need to be attached to another uh, platform like Ninja Trader? Yeah, it's a plugin for Ninja Trader, OEC Trader, SI Trader, and uh, MultiCharts.net. Okay. Uh, how does the uh, Vista compare to uh, Bookmap? Well, basically, the biggest difference is in. Way we do the large trade circles, which is I'm not going to tell people how we do it exactly, yeah. but um, we don't we don't really you know order flow is all about changes you know stuff that's going on over time, so we don't show we don't really focus that much on individual trades. We focus on okay, let's show you where a lot of lot of size traded over time. So that's one of the biggest differences uh, in terms of how heavy it is on the PC. We've just gone through um, a bunch of changes to make it much lighter. Obviously. Uh, our focus is obviously on making it performant. So uh, I've never run book maps, so I've never compared them side by side. Are the Vista circles the same as the reconstructed tape? No, okay. So reconstructed tape is kind of reconstructing trades and showing large size. The circles show trading at a level over time. So you got kind of two perspectives where the, or, the you know the order book history is you know by is just second by second the order book history. The circles don't care about time as long as you're sitting at a price, it's going to accumulate. So the actual circles, if you've looked at the depth and sales, the way the depth and sales work, the circles work a lot more like the current trade column on the depth and sales. So it's it's even got a bit of flexibility where if you tick away from a price and then come back to it within a few seconds. We're still going to accumulate, um, so it's it's got a bit of intelligence there. So you know, but basically, roughly, if I'm staying at a price and trading it, the circle gets bigger. And what you'll see as as a circle gets built in real time, you'll see the circle just moving from left to right, getting bigger and bigger. So it's slightly different. Okay. I think that, that's all the questions I see. Um, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and shut down the webinar. If you uh, have any other questions, you can visit the uh, Ask Me Any Question uh, on Theo to ask your que questions in the future. And um, what I'll do is I'll actually uh, I'll upload the, um, the slides um, so you can actually see them in higher quality. I'll upload them so far. I already have. I already posted them all. Yeah, excellent. Sir. You're good. All right. Thank you, Peter, for your time. I know it's uh, early in the morning there, and I appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks all, and uh, you know, thanks, Terry, as well, having us on, you know, having us on here.